to say welcome to uh, this symposium on cognitive processes and individual differences in arithmetic development uh, organized by David. Uh, and if that's okay, I'm just going to give the floor to you um, and introduce the, the symposium or just the presenters. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for coming in the morning or evening, whatever time it is where you are. Um, uh, I regret that one of our speakers, Jamie, isn't able to make it. So it's just myself, uh, Catherine, and Changshu. Um, and uh, I got this symposium together because I noticed that a, a lot of us were looking at uh, arithmetic from, from different perspectives. And I thought it would be interesting to, to put them all together. So I'll be giving a talk focusing on cognitive processes. And uh, Catherine and Changshu will be talking about uh, research from individual differences perspectives. Um, and so I guess that's all I have to say, and I'll, I'll lead off with mine, and then it will be Catherine and then Changshu. All right, so let me... Can everyone see that all right? Yeah, Great. that's fine. All right, so I'm going to be speaking about uh, some empirical work that I've done together with Lauren Sprague and Bob Siegler, working towards a uh, eventual unified theory of rational number arithmetic. Um, in fact, We've actually kind of created the theory by now, but this work was submitted quite a while ago, at which time we didn't have the theory yet. So I'll focus on the empirical work today and hopefully have a chance to show you the theory at some other occasion. Uh, so just to introduce the general topic, first of all, uh, which is arithmetic with rational numbers, uh, as I suppose is familiar to many of you, rational numbers, fractions, decimals, and percentages are a uniquely important topic in children's mathematical development, um, in part because uh, children's uh, uh, understanding of fractions and decimals and percentages is a great predictor of their subsequent uh, success with more advanced topics such as algebra and their general achievement in high school math. Uh, these topics are also important, however, because uh, they're used widely outside of formal education. For example, a survey of uh, employees in the United States found that over two thirds use irrational numbers as part of their job. Unfortunately, given their importance, uh, rational numbers are also a uniquely difficult topic um, and arithmetic with rational numbers is particularly difficult. So just to cite a couple of representative examples here, the two studies uh, at the bottom of the page investigated respectively fraction and decimal arithmetic among middle school children from sixth to eighth grade, and their accuracy ranged around 50% on average. This is despite having received uh, at least three and often more years of instruction in these topics. So together with Aaron Pike and Bob Siegler, I previously proposed a theory uh, called FERA to describe and explain children's performance in the area of fraction arithmetic. And I'm going to just very briefly lay out the theoretical assumptions of that theory and some of the empirical uh, phenomena that were predicted and explained by the theory. So first of all, the theory assumes that children aggressively generalize strategies uh, to solve problems in this area, meaning that they uh, frequently will use a strategy that would be appropriate for one kind of problem on a different kind of problem for which it may or may not be appropriate. And the empirical phenomena predicted by this assumption is that many or even most of children's errors will involve overgeneralization of strategies. Uh, and in fact, that is the case. Um, the second assumption is that children's choices among different strategies, such as choices between correct and incorrect strategies, depend in large part on their experience via a reinforcement learning mechanism. In other words, children learn in large part by trial and error. Each time they solve a problem, they strengthen the association between that type of problem and the procedure that they use to solve it. And this assumption implies that children's accuracies on different types of problems are going to reflect the frequencies with which they have encountered those problems in the past because they will associate correct procedures more strongly with types of problems that they encounter more frequently. Conversely, problems that they uh, encounter rarely, they are likely to associate correct procedures less strongly with those problem types and therefore perform less well on them. So children's accuracies on different types of problems should parallel the frequencies with which those problems appear in their experience, such as in math textbooks. The third main assumption is uh, regarding differences between children in their patterns of strategy use. And the theory assumes 
uh, the children, although they display apparently discrete differences in the strategies they use, these discrete differences are a consequence of underlying continuous differences in the parameters that govern learning and decision making. Um, these parameters are implemented formally in a computational model that goes along with the theory. And we previously found that uh, systematically varying the free parameters of that computational model led the model to generate four qualitatively distinct patterns of strategy use. And we subsequently found that children uh, displayed all four of those predicted patterns and that they jointly accounted for over 90% of children. So that's a very brief introduction to the FARA theory, but my goal today is to extend the theory uh, to a different domain, namely decimal arithmetic. And uh, to do so, I thought I'd uh, first just show fraction and decimal arithmetic side by side so we can consider, are they indeed similar enough or do they have enough in common that it's uh, reasonable to expect that a single theory could explain both of them? Uh, superficially, it might seem that the answer is no because although fractions and decimals are identical at a conceptual level, uh, in terms of the procedures required to actually calculate with fractions and decimals, you can see from these examples that they're completely different. Uh, fractions require attention to the presence or absence of a common denominator. In this example, one has to convert add-ends to a common denominator. When multiplying, one must multiply the denominators. Those are all concerns that don't arise in the case of decimals. In decimals, conversely, place value is very important. When adding decimals, one must attend to aligning the numbers so that you're adding digits with the same place value. And one must attend to the placement of the decimal point in the final answer to ensure it has the correct magnitude. Both of these are considerations that don't arise in the case of fractions. Nevertheless, I think there are some commonalities between fraction and decimal arithmetic, of which perhaps the most obvious is that they both involve easily confusable procedures for solving problems involving different arithmetic operations. Secondly, in both cases, many children, perhaps most, have very limited conceptual understanding with which to guide their choices of strategies. And so it seems likely that in both cases, they might rely on lower level uh, learning mechanisms, such as reinforcement learning, in order to decide which strategies to use. And finally, it seems plausible that children's learning and decisions in both areas may involve similar uh, cognitive mechanisms and parameters, which might lead to similar patterns of individual differences between children. So these observations led us to predict that the primary theoretical assumptions of our fraction arithmetic theory, FARA, would also apply to decimal arithmetic. And those were the same assumptions that I showed a couple of slides ago, aggressive generalization of strategies, strategy choices depending on experience through reinforcement learning and individuals differences in strategy use resulting from parametric variation among children. So we therefore predicted that we would find in decimal arithmetic empirical phenomena uh, analogous to those previously found in fraction arithmetic, namely that most errors would involve overgeneralization of strategies, children's accuracies on different problems would parallel their frequencies in textbooks, and children would display patterns of strategy use analogous to those previously found with fractions. So the purpose I'm going to, uh, of the study I'm going to show you today was to test these three predictions. Uh, so this is the methodology of the study. Um, we looked at uh, 92 middle school students, including sixth and eighth graders in the United States, and each student solved a set of 12 decimal arithmetic problems that are shown here. Uh, they were asked to think aloud while solving the problems and also to record their work as well as their final answers. As you can see at the bottom, the problems included uh, six each of uh, decimal addition and decimal multiplication problems. And for each arithmetic operation, we included some problems whose operands were two decimals, which I abbreviate as DD, such as 24.45 plus 0.34 or 2.4 times 1.2. And we also included some problems whose operands were one whole number and one decimal, which I abbreviate as WD, such as 5.61 plus 23, or 31 times 3.2. All right, so uh, let's go on to the results. Uh, the first prediction, recall, was that most of children's errors would involve overgeneralization of strategies. So I'd like to illustrate what I mean by overgeneralization of strategies in this context. Um, First, as a brief review, the correct strategy for adding decimals requires that you first write down the operands so as to align their decimal points. 
You then do the calculations. And finally, you bring down the decimal points from the operands into the answer. So to illustrate a use of that correct strategy with the problem 0.826 plus 0.12, here's an example from students' written work in which they've used that strategy correctly. They've aligned the decimal points. They brought the decimal points straight down into the answer and thereby obtained the correct answer 0.946. Now let's see an example of incorrectly applying that same strategy to a multiplication problem, 2.3 times 0.13. This again is an example from students' actual written work. Uh, they have, as in the case of addition, written down the operands so that their decimal points are aligned, and they brought that decimal point straight down into the answer, resulting in an incorrect answer, 2.99, whereas the correct answer should be 0.299. Now let's look at the converse case using the strategy for decimal multiplication. As a reminder, the correct strategy that's normally taught in schools for multiplying decimals is to write down the operands so that the rightmost digits align rather than their decimal points. And finally, to play after calculating, to place the decimal point in the answer so that the answer has as many decimal digits as the total number of decimal digits of the operands. So to illustrate the correct use of that strategy, again, from students own written work on the same multiplication problem we saw earlier, we see here that the student has aligned the rightmost digits instead of the decimal points and has correctly placed the decimal point in the answer, uh, yielding the correct solution. Uh, now let's see an example of applying that strategy to the same addition problem we saw earlier. So here the student has uh, incorrectly aligned the digits uh, at the, the rightmost digit rather than aligning dig digits with the same place value that's led them to add the wrong digits so that they're getting 838 instead of 946. And they also have placed the decimal point in the manner one would expect for a multiplication problem because the uh, operands in this case have three decimal digits and two decimal digits, the total is five. And so they have placed the decimal point to give the answer also five decimal digits as you would do for multiplication. So both of these solutions in the off diagonal cells are examples of strategies over generalizations. And because I'm showing them to you, you know that they did occur, but the question is how frequent were they? So I'm going to show you those data now. Uh, these are the frequencies of correct answers in green, strategy over generalization errors in blue, and all other types of errors in, in wheat, this color is called wheat, uh, for separately for addition and multiplication problems. So we can see that for addition, children answered 80% correctly, but among those who answered incorrectly, about 70% involved strategy over generalization. For multiplication, overall accuracy was much lower, around 50%, but again, around 70% of errors involved strategy over generalization, thus confirming the first prediction. The second prediction was that children's accuracies would parallel the frequencies of different types of problems in their textbooks. So to test this prediction, one would need to know how frequent different types of problems are in children's textbooks. And I uh, referred to a textbook analysis that was conducted by Jing Tian together with myself and Bob Siegler. Uh, so what we're seeing here are the frequencies of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division problems involving either DD or WD operands in math textbooks in the United States. And it probably pops out at you right away that these uh, types of problems in the upper right corner are extremely rare. In other words, children very seldom are asked to add or subtract a whole number and a decimal. So we therefore predict that this type of problem should be rather difficult, excuse me, difficult for children. Whereas uh, problems involving WD operands are quite common for multiplication and division. So multiplication problems with WD operands should be comparatively easy. Here now are the accuracies that children showed with DD and WD operands separately for addition and multiplication. For addition, as predicted, children are more accurate with DD, less accurate with WD. So for example, they're more accurate with 2.46 plus 4.1 than they are with 5.61 plus 23, which I think is not intuitively obvious that that would be the case. Just looking at those problems, it might seem that the second one is in fact the easier one. Uh, in multiplication, as expected, the opposite pattern appears. Children are more accurate with WD than DD operands. For example, they uh, err more often on 0.32 times 2.1 than on 31 times 3.2, thus confirming the second prediction. Finally, the third prediction was that children would display four distinct patterns of strategy use. So let me now say what those were. I didn't really detail them earlier. Uh, the four patterns that were observed in fraction arithmetic 
were correct strategies, which we define operationally as using correct strategies on at least three quarters of problems. Addition, subtraction, perseveration, which we define operationally as using a strategy that would be correct for addition and subtraction on at least three quarters of problems, which means you're mostly going to get correct answers on addition problems, but incorrect answers on multiplication problems. Multiplication perseveration is the reverse, so you use a multiplication strategy on at least three quarters of problems. And finally, variable strategies refers to not meeting the criteria for the previous three groups, but still using multiple strategies, both on addition and on multiplication problems. So uh, it's worth noting that these operational definitions are the exact same ones that we previously used in our analyses of fraction arithmetic. So it's not obvious that these same four patterns would necessarily occur in decimal arithmetic at all, but in fact they did. So these are the percentages of participants that met each of the four definitions. You can see that correct strategies was the most common, but still accounted for less than half of participants. The next most common was addition, subtraction, perseveration. Jointly, these patterns accounted for 97% of children. Uh, and just to illustrate the patterns concretely, I'm showing you here the percent correct answers on addition and multiplication problems with DD or WD operands within each of the four groups. So looking at the correct strategies group, which is the line with the squares, we can see that they're highly accurate on all four problem types. Looking at the line with the pluses, which is addition and subtraction perseveration, we can see that they're accurate on addition problems, but very inaccurate on multiplication problems. The line with the time sign, multiplication perseveration, they are accurate on multiplication problems, but inaccurate with addition. And finally, the variable strategies group, the circles, are accurate only on addition with two decimals, but not on any other problem type. So thus confirming the third prediction. So then let me conclude uh, just by briefly summarizing the, the main findings and their implications. Despite the superficial differences that exist between fraction and decimal arithmetic, uh, we see similar empirical phenomena in both domains, suggesting that the theoretical assumptions that we previously advanced to explain these phenomena with fractions may also apply to decimals, specifically aggressive overgeneralization of strategies, the use of reinforcement learning to determine strategy choices, and parametric variation causing individual differences in strategy use. Um, so a unified theory of, of rational number arithmetic may be possible. We're currently working on it. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for your attention and also my collaborators, Lawrence Craig and Bob Siegler and the National Science Foundation that uh, supported this work. Thank you. So I guess we maybe can take uh, one or two questions since we're fairly um, flush with time given our absence of one speaker. All right, if there are no questions, then we'll go on to the next speaker. I oh, think I'm sorry. Martha has a I has do a see a hand. Uh, Martha, I saw your, your video, yeah, you're, no, you're unmuted, but I didn't hear anything. Right, no, I was, I'm in a different spot than usual and figuring out my connections here. <laughs> so um, I, had, I had a quick question. Um, actually, I had two brief questions. One is whether the distribution of um, uh, individuals across those four patterns was similar for both um, Whole, uh, for both decimals and um, common fractions. And so that's one quick question. The other, I was thinking about your use of the term aggressive generalization and thinking about what that really means deeply to aggressively generalize something um, and whether there are other patterns of generalization that we would not call aggressive. And so just thinking about that, yeah. Yeah, so great questions, thank you. Um, so first, uh, the distribution of the, the types is a little different between fractions and decimals. Um, I believe the biggest difference is that the uh, pattern that I called multiplication perseveration is much less common with decimals than with fractions. Um, it's worth noting that that pattern describes the use of a strategy that's actually also consistent with what's usually called the whole number bias. So in the case of multiplying fractions, the, the correct strategy for multiplication is multiplying the numerators and denominators. That strategy is also what's sometimes considered to be the whole number bias strategy. Um, there is a sort of analog in the case of decimals, but it seems to be much less um, 
common. So, so the, the perseveration of that uh, strategy is more common in the case of fractions. Mm -hmm. um, so the other question, uh, I'm sorry, was, can you remind me? It was about aggressive generalization yeah. and what it mean to, to generalize less aggressively or non-aggressively. <laughs> yeah, so aggressive may not be the best uh, choice of words, but I guess what we mean here is that um, children uh, don't have a clear idea of which strategy they ought to use in a given situation and sort of every strategy is on the table. Uh, so it's not that they don't know the strategies. Uh, they mostly do know all of the strategies that they're supposed to know, but don't have a clear idea of when to use each one. So in any given situation, sort of any of the strategies they've been taught is, is a candidate. I guess that's what we mean by aggressive instead of being uh, sort of the opposite of selective, I, I might say. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, I'm thinking about that aggressive to selective. I have to reflect on that a little bit. So thank you. Yeah. All right, so we should move on to the next talk. Um, Catherine, I think that's you. All right, thank you. I'll just uh, share my screen. And uh, while I'm doing that, thank you, David, for organizing this. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I hope it's warmer where you are. Uh, it's currently minus 37 with the wind chill here. Um, which is not pleasant. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, arithmetic knowledge and how it relates to early algebraic knowledge, which is kind of a, a research question that I've been investigating recently. So I'll start with conceptual knowledge of arithmetic and conceptual knowledge includes what children know and understand about basic operations and the equal sign. And for this study that I'm gonna be talking about, I focused on three uh, aspects of conceptual knowledge that can be uh, assessed quite easily uh, via problem solving. So on inversion problems, if you understand that addition and subtraction are inversely related to each other, you don't need to do any math, you'll know that the answer is three. Um, on associativity problems, if you apply your knowledge that uh, addition and subtraction are associatively related to each other, you can make your life a little bit easier by solving the, the uh, uh, subtraction component first and then adding it to the first number. And then for equivalence, uh, to be able to solve these problems successfully, you need to be able to understand that you need to make both sides equal. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, you can add all the numbers on the left and then figure out what plus three would make that total. Or you can just cancel out the threes on each side and just add eight and six. So we can look at essentially conceptually based strategies to get a sense of what children understand about arithmetic uh, operations and the equal sign. Uh, when it comes to algebra, uh, there's been quite a few uh, researchers. Of course, my dogs stayed mute, but stayed quiet for David's entire presentation, but of course they're immediately barking now. Um, there's been a, a number of researchers who have proposed that conceptual knowledge of arithmetic uh, is needed uh, for later mathematical knowledge and skills, and those skills and knowledge include um, algebra. And I also want to note that um, the Common Core Standards and NCTM have also proposed that children should start engaging with algebra early in their schooling, and that I'm including that as a rationale for, for the age or grades of my participants uh, in this particular study. So this is a larger study, but I'm going to focus on the arithmetic and the algebra. And so I wanted to look at whether there was a link between conceptual knowledge of arithmetic and algebra. And looking at what's been done in the literature, um, what one study uh, by Matthews and, and Fox um, found that understanding of equivalence uh, as assessed through equivalence problems like the ones I just showed you in grade two predicted how kids would do on an algebra task in grade four. And then in an adult study that we recently conducted, we found that if you understood inversion as assessed by a problem solving, um, that predicted your algebra performance, but not your understanding of equivalence or associativity. So those are the two studies that I could find that were most closely related to how our study was designed. So I'll go to our design now. Uh, we had 142 grade two to four that were involved in the study with roughly equal numbers um, across grade. 
And first we asked them to solve uh, those arithmetic problems like I just showed you, inversion, associativity, and equivalence problems. And we assess their accuracy, but we mostly, I'm gonna focus now on what uh, problem solving strategy that they used. And essentially we categorized children as having used their conceptual understanding of inversion, associative, associativity or equivalence when they solved the problem or not. Um, and so that was the arithmetic task. And then we also, um, um, Shimoni et al uh, kindly, uh, uh, lent me their task, gave me access to their task, their algebra task that had been de developed for, for a study that they published in 2018. And so um, the measures that we looked at were accuracy, did they get the problem correct? And also their problem solving strategy. And I'm gonna focus on the accuracy data because some of the kids had quite a bit of difficulty giving a strategy of how they'd actually solve their problem, uh, solve the problem. So uh, Shimoni et al uh, had looked at, had uh, a set of, of al early algebra problems that were divided into three types. And the first type is um, uh, were generalized arithmetic um, uh, problems. And so you can see that would closely re relate to some of the arithmetic problems that we were, we were using in the arithmetic task, but it's essentially uh, the ability to identify the relationships between numbers, the manipulation of operations and their properties and the transformation of solutions and equations. And the problem that we used to assess generalized arithmetic was the following. Uh, if star plus star equals four, then star plus star plus six equals what? And generally, children didn't have a big problem showing their work for this one, so we did get a sense of their strategy, but you'll see that we had some difficulties later on with strategies on the other types of problems. Um, so the second uh, area of, of algebra that we looked at was modeling concepts that uh, Shimoni et al. defined as generalizing regularities presented implicitly through various problem contexts and the problem um, that illustrates this was uh, John uses stickers to build the following pattern. What kind of ball would appear in the 15th place? Explain how you got your answer. And a, quite a few kids had trouble explaining their answer, um, but they were able to get an answer. And then the third type of algebra was functional thinking. Um, and this is expressing numerical and figural patterns as functions and algebraic expressions. And the problem that we used was the following. Um, the table uh, was a trapezium, five children can be seated. If two tables are connected, then eight children can be seated. And the first part was uh, how many children can be seated at three tables, justify your answer. And the second part is how many children 10 tables, justify your answer. And you can imagine that kids in grade two really struggled <laughs> with this one. So I'm only gonna focus on their uh, response to the first part, uh, part A. So what did we find? Um, in terms of conceptually based strategy use, um, I would like to first of all draw your attention to the vertical axis, which is uh, tops out at 50%. Um, and so actually the performance was quite disappointing in terms of conceptually based strategy use. Um, our first concept is inversion on the left, and you can see that it increases across grade. Um, the second arithmetic concept in the middle is associativity. It also increases across grade, but is much less uh, used. Uh, conceptually based strategies are much less frequent on associativity problems. And then for equivalence problems, uh, essentially grade threes did not understand equivalence. And then uh, there was a little bit better understanding by grade four. Um, so overall, very low uh, use of conceptually based strategies. Um, overall results for our algebra task were more encouraging. Uh, we go up to 100% essentially here, and we again see that there are grade differences um, and the generalized arithmetic and the modeling concepts problem. The first two problems um, had higher accuracy than that functional thinking problem. So that's our arithmetic and algebra results. But the, the thing that I wanna focus on, the research question I wanna focus on is, can we predict um, algebra results based on how they did on the arithmetic task? And so there's a few regression analyses here. 
And so what we did is we ran three regression analyses and we included grade and conceptually based strategy use on the three problem types. And we can see that for generalized arithmetic, um, our R squared is, uh, and our adjusted R squared are very low, but it is significant. Um, but grade uh, significantly predicted performance on the generalized arithmetic. Uh, inversion was marginally almost significant. In terms of modeling concepts, we essentially got the same pattern that grade predicted performance, but this time it was equivalence um, that predicted uh, performance on the modeling concepts. And then on functional thinking, again, grade, um, but this time inversion and associativity. So that you can see that, but associativity is negative. Um, uh, the beta value, the standardized beta value is, is negative rather than positive. All right. So a very quick run through of the regression analyses. Um, first thing I kind of take home messages is, is that it's a little bit hard to get too excited about this data because there was such a low use of conceptually based strategies that there's a concern about floor effects. Um, in past research, the findings about grade have been very conflicting. Uh, even within our own lab, sometimes we find grade differences. Sometimes we find no grade differences in terms of conceptually based strategy use. So this is one of the studies that does find grade differences. Um, you might suspect that maybe it's the school or maybe it's the classroom that accounts for some studies find grade differences and others not. And yet, you know, there are multiple schools involved in each study. There are multiple classrooms involved in, in each study. And it's the same curriculum in all studies. Um, so we're still puzzling about these grade differences that come and go. But you can also see that um, from the data that, that conceptually based strategy use varies by concept. And I've talked about this in previous studies that we tend to sometimes want to, to make conclusions about conceptual knowledge based on only one uh, um, type of, of or aspect of conceptual knowledge. And yet our conclusions have to vary depending on what concept, what part of conceptual knowledge is being assessed. Um, in terms of predicting algebra performance from the conceptual knowledge of arithmetic, there was a lot of variance, as you can see, that was still left to explain in those regression analyses. So there's obviously a lot more than conceptual knowledge of arithmetic that explains algebra performance. And I think David touched on this a little bit as well in, in his, his uh, research. But again, it's still um, what, how, um, how you perform on algebra, if it is predicted by concept or, or conceptual knowledge, it depends on which aspect of conceptual knowledge is being assessed. Um, so I'll just finish off with some limitations and future directions. Um, we talked about the floor effects and conceptually based strategy use. It was a limited algebra task. The algebra task from Shimoni et al. Um, was I think 24 problems, we used three because essentially this was just an exploration. We thought, okay, let's just tack this on as part of a larger study. Let's just put in three additional algebra problems at the end, just to see if there is something to uh, the idea that uh, conceptual knowledge can predict early algebra knowledge uh, and skills. And so our, our algebra task was very, very limited. Um, and also there's the issue of the grade appropriateness of the algebra task. So Shimoni et al, that um, study was for grade four to seven uh, students and we used grade two to four um, children uh, were included in our study. And so even though they did fairly well, the accuracies are, are fairly high. They're much better than the conceptually based strategies in terms of floor effects. We, we picked, we hand picked the problems quite carefully to, to ensure that grade two kids could be successful on them. So there are some issues with our algebra task. Um, in terms of future directions, we need some more predictor variables to, to try to account for more of the variability. Uh, this study actually also included uh, several executive function tasks. So, well, we, we are gonna be exploring how those predict algebra performance as well. And we're gonna expand that algebra task. And I think we need to, to expand our, our grade range as well. Uh, and, and we're currently doing that uh, in a study that, that, we're, that we're working on. And so I'll just finish off by saying, 
as always, can't do this research without the students and the teachers and the schools being involved. And also thanks to, to the funding agency. And that's it for me. So I think there are time, there is time for questions, if there are any. I think there's one question. There's one sure. hand up. Sure. Yeah, so I have a question. Um, a common element between your talk and David Braithwaite's talk is the lack of conceptual understanding as a serious factor in learning of arithmetic. Uh, different types of arithmetic doesn't seem to matter. And it, it's not just these two talks, everyone is getting that. Um, some work uh, that Lauren Schiller and I have done recently, she's on this talk also, uh, indicates that even when children have the conceptual knowledge to be applied, they don't apply it to arithmetic. And I'm curious about your thoughts about why this is so slowly developing and why the asymptotic level of application of conceptual knowledge is so low and what might be done to promote uh, more and more rapid application of conceptual knowledge to arithmetic. Yeah, I mean, it's something we've been struggling with for years in my lab, um, the kind of the frustration of it's like, you must know this, uh, but you're not applying it. So problem solving uh, to assess conceptual knowledge is a pretty stringent criteria. Um, and, and so other researchers have, have proposed other, you know, multiple ways of assessing it and so forth. And, and I absolutely agree with them. Um, we didn't in this study, we have in previous studies. Um, in previous studies where we've actually asked kids and, and talked to kids about, you know, here's a different way of solving the problem. Um, what do you think? Was this a smart way for, you know, the, a fictitious child to do this? Um, one of the things that has taken us aback is how many children say, no, that's cheating. Um, and, and so they've proposed, oh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't possibly do that. That would be cheating. Uh, you're supposed to do all of the math um, and you're supposed to go from left to right. And we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get them away from going left to right and looking at the entire problem. And we've also found that in, in some circumstances, principals have told us, oh, no, you can't do it that way. You have to do all the math. It's cheating. And so I think there's this general attitude that you start from the left and you go to the right, and, and that supersedes applying that conceptual knowledge. Um, the lovely thing, though, about these problems from a researcher perspective is that they're novel to the children. And so we know that they can't just apply a formula or a strategy that they've been taught in schools. And so that's really nice um, that when they do apply it, they actually have to understand it. But on the other hand, it seems to me that maybe our curriculums, at least in Canada, should be including these types of problems um, that, that you know, in, in textbooks and in teaching and actually by including those types of problems like the inversion, the associativity and equivalence and talking about it, it might get children more, more primed to apply their conceptual knowledge. So I don't think I've touched on all of your question, uh, but I've picked on a couple of little bits, but I think David might also have some comments on that as well. Actually, thank you, but I'd, I'd better not because I want to make sure we leave the next speaker enough time. <laughs> so I'll so, just go on. I'll mute myself then. Right, yeah, if there are no other questions on that talk, uh, Chang, would you like to take it? Thanks so much, David, for organizing this. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Chang, and um, I planned a little bit uh, live demo and I heard that sometimes this can go horribly wrong so um, I'm gonna present a video so just give me one moment to set things up
everyone see my screen? Thank you very much. So there we go. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Chang Xu. Today, on behalf of my collaborators, Dr. Dilaro Burr and Dr. Lafef, I'm going to share with you our ongoing research on number integration. Mathematics depends on an abstract symbol system, which represents a complex set of numerical and functional associations. Through abstraction, we no longer have to depend on real-world objects to solve math problems. We can just manipulate math symbols, which makes the problem-solving process way more efficient. The development of math competence is a hierarchical process. To start off, we have the most fundamental numeracy associations. For example, you may think about the cardinal associations, such as 2 is bigger than 1 and smaller than 3, or the ordinal associations. 1, 2, 3 is in order, but 2, 1, 3 is not. Moving on to the more functional arithmetic associations. Additive associations include two complementary associations, addition and subtraction, which involve representing quantities as units of one. Multiplication and division are the more abstract multiplicative associations, which involve representing quantities as units of units. Previous research has shown that multiplicative representations are constructed based on existing additive representations. Once we acquire the fundamental numeracy and arithmetic associations, we can expand our understanding of the mathematics system from whole number to rational numbers. The hierarchical structure continues here. For example, fractions represent a racial relationship between two units, which requires flexible manipulation of symbols. Fraction knowledge is built on the understanding of multiplicative reasoning, both conceptually and procedurally. To further expand this system, knowledge of algebra is built on the understanding of rational numbers, including fractions. Algebra focuses on properties that are common to both whole numbers and rational numbers. When students lack the skills to perform fraction arithmetic, learning new algebraic concepts is impeded. Now looking at this diagram altogether right here, mathematical competencies can be conceptualized as layers of knowledge, with the more fundamental numeracy associations as the core, and the more complex mathematical associations as the additional layers over the core. Over the past few years, we proposed a hierarchical symbol integration model, trying to capture the hierarchical associations among the mathematic symbol system. The core assumption of the model is that the hierarchy of mathematical competence is built through integration of number associations within a unified mental network. Integration occurs when the acquired associations become interconnected and fully accessible so that solvers can use them flexibly to solve mathematical problems. In the present research, we wanted to test out this hierarchical structure of the model with adults. We expected additive associations to mediate the relations between ordered judgments and multiplicative associations. Multiplicative associations to mediate the relations between additive associations and fraction arithmetic. And finally, fraction arithmetic to mediate the relations between multiplicative association and algebra. Putting everything together, we expected direct relations between adjacent layers of the hierarchy and indirect relations for all of the non-adjacent layers of the hierarchy. In 2020 to 2021, we recruited 236 undergraduate participants from the Department of Psychology and Cognitive Science. The study was carried out through an online data collection platform called Gorilla. The study took about an hour. 
participants start off with a digit backwards spend task as a control measure of working memory. And then they completed an order judgment task where they were presented with three numbers at a time and had to decide whether sequences were in ascending order or not as quickly as possible. Four whole number arithmetic problems were presented in four blocks of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Participants were asked to type their answer in the provided text box as quickly and accurately as possible. As you can see, the questions are pretty simple, so they are not allowed to use paper and pencil or calculator to solve the problems. In terms of the scoring for the speeded order judgment and whole number arithmetic tasks, we used response times adjusted for accuracy. Moving on to the more advanced mathematics measures, participants were encouraged to use paper and pencil to solve the problem with no time limit. For fraction arithmetic, they solved 16 problems in four blocks of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division presented in multiple choice format. Half of the problems have common denominators and the other half have uncommon denominators. And the FOIL answers were created based on the common misconceptions and errors. For algebra, participants solved 10 problems presented in multiple choice format as well. Items require middle and high school level knowledge of algebra, such as factoring expressions, solving for x in an algebraic equation, and simplifying expressions and exponents. In terms of scoring, we use proportion correct since there's no time limit for those tasks. What are the findings? Let's start with the more basic descriptives. Here's a violin plot for the four operations of the whole number arithmetic. Here the y-axis shows the adjusted response time measured in seconds. So the higher the value, the poorer the performance. And the x-axis shows each of the whole number arithmetic operation. Within those violin plots, the white little dots represent the median. The thicker bar in the middle shows the interquartile range, and the thinner black line represents the range of performance for each operation. As you can see from this violin plot, the patterns of distribution of addition and subtraction are relatively similar, and the patterns of multiplication and division are relatively similar with longer adjusted response time and more variable performance for the multiplicative operations than the additive operations. Here's another violin plot for the more advanced mathematic task, fraction arithmetic and algebra. Because these tasks are non-speeded, the y-axis here shows the proportion correct. Based on the violin plot, on average, students did pretty well on both of the tasks, given that the median is close to 80%. However, if you take a look at the range of performance as well as the overall shape of these violin plots, there was a lot of variability in scores, showing that some of the students really struggled with these tasks. For the research question we are mainly interested in, we tested a structural equation model. The model fit was good, and the findings support the idea of our hierarchical symbol integration model. Here I'm going to walk you through the main results. First, working memory was controlled in the model. And then in terms of the measurement portion, we had two latent factors. One is additive associations extracted from addition and subtraction. The other one is multiplicative associations extracted from multiplication and division. All of the factor loadings are very good. Moving on to the structural portion of the model. We found that ordinal judgments predicted additive latent factor, which in turn predicted multiplicative latent factor. And then multiplicative latent factor predicted fraction arithmetic, 
which in turn predicted algebra. In other words, all of the direct path for the adjacent layers of the hierarchy were significant. Additionally, we have also tested the indirect paths for the intervening layers. So order judgments indirectly predicted multiplicative latent factor through additive latent factor. And then additive latent factor indirectly predicted fraction arithmetic through multiplicative latent factor. And finally, multiplicative latent factor indirectly predicted algebra through fraction arithmetic. All of the indirect paths for the non-adjacent layers of the hierarchy were also significant. So these results support our hypotheses. Taking a step back, mathematical knowledge is complex. Students can succeed with some aspects of mathematics but struggle with others. And in part, these difficulties may occur because mastery of basic knowledge supports students' learning of more complex skills. In the present research, we have shown evidence to support the view that mathematical measures were related hierarchically, capturing the increasing complexity of symbolic associations and supporting the hierarchical framework of our hierarchical symbol integration model. Are there consequences if students do not fully integrate their knowledge within each hierarchical layer? Well, mathematical concepts build upon each other. And so if students do not master each layer, it is likely that those difficulties will carry it over into the next layer. Students who struggled when they were learning basic arithmetic will continue to face challenges when learning more complex mathematics. So we believe that knowledge acquisition and efficiency should be fully integrated when the inner layers of knowledge are consolidated before moving towards the outer layers. Thank you so much for having us to be part of this awesome symposium. Also, thanks to the funding agency, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada for the support of this research. And lastly, thank you so much for your attention. Any questions for the final presentation? I think maybe you have a question. Yeah, thank you. That was an interesting talk. Um, I, I had two questions and maybe you could just choose one that you find more interesting and react to it. Uh, so one is, I, I guess you know of, um, some earlier findings uh, from Siegler et al, I think 2012, that found that um, division uh, is an independent predictor of algebra when controlling for fractions, which did not appear in your current analysis, perhaps because multiplication and division were loaded into the same latent factor. So there wasn't actually a test for whether division on its own um, was an independent predictor. But I, I wonder if, uh, you know, how, how would your model accommodate that fact, given that division is still a multiplicative relation? So according to the theory, it should only affect algebra via fractions and, and should not, if I understood correctly, have that independent effect. That, that was the one question. And the other is if you could say a little more about what you mean by integration, like precisely what is integrated and what is not integrated. Thank you. I think those are excellent questions. So for the first question, uh, I, I completely agree, especially for, for the stage where students are still learning uh, or mastering arithmetic whole number skills and fraction division is definitely the better predictor of fraction. And we actually have had a paper came out with Chinese children in grade four, where they have just mastered division in grade three. Uh, and in grade four, division is definitely the only unique factor predicting um, fraction knowledge later on. But uh, with these data, with adults, our assumption is that uh, they have already mastered the whole number arithmetic skill. So they, they should have relatively similar performance uh, between multiplication and division. 
and the violin plus shows that their performance are very, very similar. So once they've passed the stage trying to mastering multiplicative associations, we believe that those two, um, two uh, multiplicative operations would be integrated together. So that's the first question. And for the second questions in terms of what do we mean by integration, I think <clears throat> by integration, we mean that uh, participants or children need to, or, or students, uh, need to have both the conceptual knowledge and procedural knowledge for that specific uh, mathematical skill we're talking about. So they need to understand the concept thoroughly, but at the same time, they need to have the fluency ready so that when they are solving a given mathematical problem, they can flexibly and uh, efficiently to assess knowledge. Uh, so yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> If there's no questions for the last talk and you still have a question for the previous talks, this I think there's still some time uh, if you want to ask it. If not, that's fine. Um, it was it was great presentations. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, uh, David, for organizing and for the presenters for uh, this great symposium. The great results, really interesting. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the weekend. <laughs>